Um, I'm Christina McCary. I'm the direct, uh, executive director here at Historic Ross Ford, uh, and I'd like to welcome you to the lecture today. Uh, I, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Greg Huber, who is our uh, lecturer today. He is a Bard and Pels historian, an independent scholar, consultant, and principal owner of Past Perspectives and Eastern Bard and Consultants, both historic and cultural resource companies uh, based in Lehigh County, Pennsylvania. Um, Huber, uh, since 1974, has specialized in pre-Civil War era house and barn architecture of uh, Holland, Dutch, and Pennsylvania Swiss German areas. He has documented more than 8,000 vernacular barns, and that include more than 5,000 homestead barns. Uh, he is the author of more than 340 articles on barn and house architecture. Um, his book, The Historic Barns of Southeast Pennsylvania, Architecture and Preservation, 17th and 18th, 1900, was published by Schiffer Publishing in 2017, and it achieved number one on the Amazon bestselling uh, list in the very specific category of vernacular architecture. <laughs> we do have that um, here today that you can purchase uh, and get signed. Um, so without further ado, I will turn it over to Greg Huber. Thanks everybody for showing up today. Sorry about all the snow that's outside. <laughs> Yesterday I would have never made it here, so I'm lucky that it was planned for Saturday. I really don't know where, a couple things before we start here. I don't know where I'm actually going to stand. Is this going to be good? Can these lines of uh, uh, lights turn be turned off? Yeah. Just this line, maybe? Yeah. And maybe the back one? You know, let's we'll see how you do it. Sassafras was in the United States, well, not the United States, sorry, in the 17th century, what it represented? Anybody? Yeah. Sassafras tea? Ooh. Right, oh, yeah. it was Sassafras tea, but what did it represent? It was the first industry in North America. Oh, wow. wow. The, the album of, the is here, album of rare images of early barns, barn population graphs, hex signs, date stones, and barn timbers. So you can look at that. Anybody who wants a part of mine, they're up here. Uh, what else can I say by way of introduction? Not a whole lot. Um, I'm going to put this to the side. If I need it, I'll use it. Um, Lancaster County really is amazing. You know, I always, the Mennonites first settled right around here, I believe. That's right. And anyway, that's the... Uh, that is the map of Lancaster County. There's two areas in all of the eastern states that have been called the most productive farmland 
in North America. Whether that's true or not, I have no idea. But one of them is in Lancaster County in the middle third of the county. The other area is in Schoharie County, which is where some Ger Palatine Germans settled. And those two areas have really, really fertile um, land. And that was, uh, that induced, that was an inducement to build large barns and really go at it with farming um, procedures. Okay, did, did you say Perry? What, what was the other county? Schoharie County. It's about midway between the Catskills and the Adirondacks. There's the Schoharie River Valley, okay. and it's just south of the Mohawk River Valley. Okay? Major barn types that we're going to cover today, ground barn, that's a one level ground barn, the Schweitzer, which is the main focus today, the standard barn, which is the second type that basically supplanted this, the extended four bay barn. These are the three types of four bay barns. We'll get into what a four bay barn is in just a second. And pardon me, just <coughs> in just a second. The double decker barn, which, which, an example of which is the finest in all of Pennsylvania. It was built in 1795. I don't, I, I may have a picture of it. It was a great barn. It's in Paradise, which is east of uh, Lancaster City. The English Lake District Farm, we always have to put that in. It's much more common in Cheshire County and Delaware County in the southern half of Bucks and uh, uh, Montgomery County. And then assortment, the various assortment of other barn styles and types, okay? This is a stone and ground level barn. It's a one level barn. There's no basement area. Right now, of course, we're in the basement of a Schweitzer barn. This barn is a Schweitzer. Are we going to do any kind of a, um, a tour of the barn at all after the talk? I certainly could lead people around if they want to. Anyway, this is a barn in Bucks County near Argus, and it's uh, probably built around 1790. There's a there's a house, a log house right across the street, and on the log lintel is a carved date of 1769. This is a this is a stone construction about halfway up, about eight feet. And here are logs. This area right here and here, this is not an original door. That was where the animals were stabled, okay? And above that are the mounds, okay? This is the wagon, a wagon uh, doors and it led into the wagon bay or the middle bay. There's no basement, I didn't finish my statement. There's no basement underneath the wagon bay. That is the basic definition. I mean, there could be variations if you want to argue, you can go outside. But that's the basic definition. It's an unbanked barn that has no basement under the wagon bay. And every major, well, except for the crop stores, the three major areas of farm activity, the threshing on the middle of the wagon bay and the cow stable areas were all on the ground level. Very much unlike this barn here, okay? Some make basic areas of inquiry, a four bay barn, is easily the most prevalent barn style in all of Pennsylvania. It's not actually a barn style. That, that, um, I'm sorry. It is a, it is a style. It's not a type of barn. There's a big difference between a type and a style. And if you really want to know more about that, books are for sale this year. <laughs> uh, four bay barns in Pennsylvania. I haven't memorized all these things. I mean, I know them, but I'm going down the line soon. Just. Bear with me. There's probably about 60 to 70,000 in the state, most of which, the great majority, probably 80, maybe even 90 percent of them are in the southern half of the state. Pre-1800 Schweitzers have been identified with about 15 dated barns, okay? Dates that are carved into stone, possibly wood, they're pretty rare. When is the term Schweitzer first seen? Materials used in 18th century barns. Dimensions of 18th century barns. This is one of my most interesting, uh, captivating areas of, of a barn. Mennonites came to Lancaster County about 1710, and they found what? White Oak. White Oak is the king of timber framing in basically North America and probably much, not all of it, but much of certain countries in Europe. Uh, and that's what I'm saying. White Oak was prominent. Remember when I said that one-third area of 
of Lancaster County white oak was the predominant species of use. Okay. Next. This is a Schweitzer barn. Oh. Now I'll use our friendly Sasquatch stick here. This is a Schweitzer. What makes it a Schweitzer? Okay. Yeah. If you look at the rear roof slope here, it goes from there to there, and you compare that with here to there, it's much longer because of this added forebed. It's not an added forebed. I don't want to say that. It's an appendage that's original to the barn. It wasn't added like it was an afterthought. <coughs> Pardon me, 20 or 30 or 50 years after the, the original barn was built. But a Schweitzer barn is a, a barn with an asymmetrical roof line, unlike a standard barn that has a symmetrical roof line. It's banked here. If you go around the corner, the rear corner of the barn, you can see that the uh, wagons used to uh, this drive in to the uh, wagon bay. So we either these barns would either be built into a slope of ground or they would be dug out. Okay? And the timbering of the upper floor level, like this barn, does not extend into this uh, four bay appendage. Mm -hmm. So that is a prototypical uh, Schweitzer barn. Okay? And this barn is a sub a barn that I already know, but that doesn't matter. Here, this is a standard barn, an example of one. Here, the roof slope, or rather the length of the rear slope, roof, roof slope, and the front is equal, and that's a standard barn. These barns didn't really come in until about 1805. I know of one example in an English-based area, and that's not German, of course, and that was built in 1792, which is one of those oddities of the, um, of the barn world in Pennsylvania. Okay, it has a four bay here, it's a cantilevered area here over the stable wall, the basement ceiling joist cantilever over. In other words, these, I don't get the, the opportunity to do this. So these cantilever joists in the Schweitzer here go from the rear wall all the way out beyond that stable wall, it doesn't look like a stable wall now, to the very front of the barn. Okay, these, what is the age of this barn supposed to be? 1780. And how do you arrive at that date? Well, it's in our archival paperwork, but it could be, it might not be 1780. Could be 1780. <laughs> I would think, I would trust your... But the barn wasn't built until then? No, it wasn't. It was bought. Where was it, where was it built? Uh, I think it was Manor's house. It, it was tear down in 1970, and okay. Rockford bought it for a dollar and plucked it here mm -hmm. and put it on the foundation of where the original Sam Barnes Right. Oh. Um, now, with the money that they uh, paid for it, did they take out a loan for that? <laughs> <laughs> so, so in any event, uh, this is I'm, I'm just not used to giving barn talks in barns. I have a few, which may sound strange. This is a great, great bean. Uh, this, this is a summer bean. This bean, this big cross from end to end bean, is a probably a tulip wood. And it's probably about, do you have your tape measure handy with you? Yeah. Yeah. It's probably 13, maybe, who's the builder here? How, how big is that? <coughs> what do you think? 16. 16 feet high. 16? Yep. 16 feet high. 15. 15. Yeah. Okay. That's a big bean, boy. And look at how arrow straight that is. Mm -hmm. Jesus. <laughs> Part. What do you got? 12. 12? Oh, it's got to be no, more. 12. It's more yeah. Oh, it, it's up above here. Yeah, I see it. Yeah. All right, so it's 14 or 15 inches. Yeah. That's pretty big for a summer bean. But I mean, if you eyeball it up and everything from end to end, that is very, very straight. Mm -hmm. And that would help us believe that the, the timber came from a tulip tree. Tulip tree, very, very often, not always, they're arrow straight. And they're very easy to work with. They're like white pine. And it's not unusual for me to see tulip wood summer beans in barns like this, even very big ones. And they were supported by a few posts. These posts are not original, almost unquestionably. Um, I don't see a splice. Maybe there's a splice. Anybody see a splice here? Yeah, there's, one there. there's, there's one back here. There is. There's, uh, there's, there's, okay. there's a splice right there in the back one. I don't know if that's part of the I don't know if this that's is a true. Of ours, but yeah, it probably is. Uh, many, many of the summer beans are of oak. 
okay? A true summer meeting, if you go up to New England and look at the houses there from 1640 or so to beyond 1750, a true summer bean is a summer bean that's not supported by any posts. What is a summer bean? Yeah. Well, that's what I'm, I'm, trying to okay. I'm trying to show you. A summer bean is a uh, longitudinal timber. These are, the, the joists here are transversely set or oriented. The summer beans are longitudinally oriented, end wall to end wall, okay? And they support the joists above, okay? But I'm, all I'm saying is that, is that the Timber Framers Guild is really very precise. It's an it's a organization based basically in New England. There's other people around too. Um, it's a drop girt, uh, I'm sorry, no, I'm forgetting, because I hardly ever use it. Oh boy, another name. A drop, uh, I, I'm forgetting, sorry about that. Anyway, the true, ang the, the, the true summer beams do, are not supported by posts, and that's the way it is up in these early houses in New England. So, there we go. How much span can they get? You know. I mean, it depends. You mean without being sliced? Yeah, never drop these posts in here. It's hard to do. Well, for a barn, that's true, but not for a house. Uh, okay. a, house a house can go maybe, you know, 30 feet or something. Okay. Like that. Don't forget, they came from giant uh, trees. You know, back in the time of the forest age. Um, this is a stone standard barn with a super narrow foreman. It only extends out, the joists only extend out, this is in Chester County, uh, extend out for about two and a half feet. Normally, they extend um, four to five feet in standard barns. In Schweitzer's, they can go up to seven. Yes, sir. What is a four bay? And what's its use? What is it used for? Four bay is the area that extends beyond on the second floor. So a four bay is not at all concerned. We're not concerned with four bays here in the basement level because it doesn't exist. But it exists on the second floor. Anything beyond the stable wall above that is considered a four bay. Okay. They originated, well, we'll get to that. They're originated in the eastern cantons of Switzerland. Okay. Next. Does that represent additional functionality, or yes. what did it, it still Well, not an additional. It was just allocated for a different spot. And you're going to get. You're going to talk about because there's been differences in this. Like in that first barn, you showed the roof and how it came out further. The real big one. Is there an advantage to having that extra we'll size? See that. Okay. We'll see that. Okay. This yeah. is a barn, a Gorsuch barn. It's a wonderful barn. This was illustrated in the book in 1955, I guess. Uh, you can see these uh, brick insets here, and it's in Maryland again. And uh, I just put it there to, to show the spectacular uh, stonework and, and brickwork uh, taken together. Okay, these are, well, the back, excuse me, wheat here, and then the diamonds. And then the, hor what we call a horizontal diamond at the top. Okay, the next one. This is a stone to peak barn with a filled-in louver. So here, sorry, filled-in louver window opens on the end wall. Okay, so stone to the eaves level, this is the eaves level on an end wall. The eaves level on the front wall and the rear wall goes to this level. The reason I'm bringing this up the, with an emphasis is because it went through a evolution that the earliest stone barns were stone to the peak. Stone to the peak meaning the ridge peak. The ridge line, okay, and they were built from um, early on, mid middle part of the of the 18th century up until even later. I mean, I, I know a few uh, uh, standard barns that were built as late as the 1880s, which is really amazing. I mean, my grandmother was born in 1889, um, and then starting about 1830, with some exception, 1830, maybe 1840, stone was uh, appeared to the eaves level here, okay? And then after about 18, and again, depending on the area, depending on certain things, the barns uh, evolved into a, a frame construction from the, the top level here where the basement is from about there or so all the way up was framed. 
Okay, so that was the evolution that went from stone to the peak, stone to the eaves level, and then oral frame. Okay, Let, why don't we just do the forebay? What is a forebay? Um, a forebay, well, as I said, a forebay is anything on the second floor beyond the state of the wall. So it's different. It can be confusing for people who don't see many barns. Uh, but, uh, it's why you compare to the standard barn. A standard barn is kind of strange. The standard barn in Bob Esling's book that came out in 1992 may not uh, be a German-based barn at all. And I think Bob, later on in his years, admitted that it may not be German-based, actually. The earliest barn that I mentioned before, 1792, was in a very English area, and it may have come from that English Lake District style barn that I had brought up before, okay? This is another stone to the peak barn, standard barn, symmetrical roof line, but this has a date right there, and you can't see it, of course, of 1860. A stone to the peak uh, structure is very late for that uh, type of barn. Here we forgot the barn owner went crazy with the new signs here. <laughs> There's four different types here. I'm actually, I'm sorry, five. This is a seven point star. This is a five, uh, this is a six point star. This is the most common. This is a teardrop uh, type, teardrop here, and a teardrop there, okay? Another, another standard barn, symmetrical roof line, but that barn is um, stone of the eaves level. And it was probably built after 1850 or so. They could be built up until about the 1870s, they were built. On that picture before that one, was the, the other side that we can't see, the, uh, the, side? the back side, the back side where the, the, the bank wall? is, would that have been stone or was that also frame? Are you saying the rear wall? The rear was, wall, yeah. It was partly stone. It, okay. would, it would be stone on either side of the wagon doors. Okay. And that's the, that's the case with the Schweitzer barns. It's the case with a lot of uh, four-bay barns, okay? This is gonna be on the front cover of my book. And I wanna show you, this is kind of an interesting story. You never know what's behind uh, publishers and editors doing certain kinds of things. But I wanted this barn, this image of the barn on the front cover. Why? Because it was halfway between, it, was a trans, it wasn't, you could say it was a transitional form. It was only stone to the eaves level. It wasn't stone to the peak. It wasn't framed from the basement all the way up. And I wanted that to be on the front cover. But they won out. Obviously, that's not the, that's not, this is not the barn. So why did this barn, this is an English-based barn. This book is probably 90% German-based. So why would an English-based barn be on the front cover? This is a barn near Kutztown, um, on Route 662. Anybody want to guess why this barn was put on there? The most practical picture. The stone? Well, that's true. More stone. That is true, but you have to get a little more specific. But that's a good thing. Yeah, higher contrast, more color. <laughs> the reason is because when I took the picture huh. back a number of years ago, there's so much blue sky above there, it was perfect to include the title. <laughs> 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 and, that's the, and that's the reason. In any event, that barn I really liked, and then I went back there about, I don't know, seven, eight years ago. Could you go back? I went back there, and I couldn't find, it was about two to three miles northwest of Fogelsville. Anybody know Fogelsville? Yeah. In Lehigh County, okay. Um, where's the darn barn? I can't find it, I can't find it. And the reason I couldn't find it is because they took this magnificent front wall and threw it away. Um, I don't know what happened to the barn stuff, uh, they also changed this. Uh, it, it just changed, but I was lucky to at least get a photograph of it. This is this. Oh, go, go back. Thank you. Stable wall is here. Okay, on the standard barn, which is this, which is this as an example, the stable wall is recessed back probably about four or five feet. So the area from that stable wall out four or five feet on the second floor level is considered the four bay. Okay, that's the four bay of a standard barn. I really don't like that definition. I don't like that discussion that focuses in on that. It just doesn't, it doesn't really add up. Now when you have a Schweitzer, and we'll see a, a few other examples of that, that makes sense like this barn here. It's a very distinctive, separate um, construction of the barn as it was originally built, okay? 
Here's the just the four bay would have also given protection, weather oh, protection yeah. for the door. Oh that yes, was, yes. In yes. my mind, that was often a, a big key part of it too. Well, but, but my yeah, my thought though is that a bay is a distinct area of construction in, in certain ways. I mean, I know you have a wagon bay, and there's no there's no extra you know qualifier there, and you have a, an end bay or you know these are bays, so that that's true. With your definition or your approach, yeah, that would be correct. But I, I just I don't feel comfortable with calling this a, a four bay barn. I just don't. You know, that's what scholarship is about. It evolves from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. Not in a straight linear line, but more than a zigzag line. So we can call that a line. Okay. Well, one thing, how, how language is used. I drove trucks for Hess Mill out in Paradise many years ago, mm -hmm. and they would tell me if you walk into the four bay, I always thought the four bay was the underneath area that would have been prime. And so we all knew they could put it in the bin that's off the four bay. And we weren't upstairs, we were on the right. ground, right. Down, on the ground a, level. A common thing that's said, right. And and so, you know, that I would imagine there's a lot of other people like me that would think that the four bay was on the ground level. Oh yeah, no, that's true, that's true. But where would the four bay be? That's, that's the thing, you have a basement. It's that space that's over, that, that, the, that what you call the four bay overhangs. Right, right. Yeah. You know, so. um, yes. I guess, too, the thing that stands out as you talk about this is we look for purpose in the form. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. What's the purpose in the form? Yes. So that's what that gentleman was talking about, the protection. I see that. So that's why I was asking, is there an advantage to the different sizes of four bays or was there functioning, a functionality associated right. with the different well, sizes? Well, form follows function. You know the old saying, that form follows function. And, you know, I didn't really want to get into this too much, but... But Ensminger, who's been to Switzerland, I've never been there. I've been to Germany, but never Switzerland. He said that it developed out of a thing called the Tolina. And the Tolina was an area where the four bay was, and it was it was structured in a particular way. And he thought when he learned about Tolina and another form called the Chisner, that which is an which is a a, a drying rack, so to speak, um, and it's a freestanding out in the, out in the fields, um, that that was, they were associated with each other like that. So, okay. Here is a barn star. I like to call barn decorations on the exterior of a barn, a barn star, not a hex sign. It, it may well have had protection for, for warding away of evil, but on the exterior, it was probably had more of a decorative basis than warding away for evil. But there's all kinds of things. There's a whole world of knowing and understanding um, symbols and signs and marks and apotropaic uh, uh, things, which means warding away of evil. Uh, this particular star is very common. There's you know, six, eight, and 12 pointed stars are the most common. I think they probably started without proof, probably started in the general Kutztown area. There are more barns that are decorated in, in this kind of thing around Kutztown than any other area that I know of. And here, mm -hmm. <coughs> each, each point is articulated with a cross, and then you have the outer band. When was that painted? Probably, that, that photo was probably taken around 2010 or something like that, maybe 2008. That was probably up there for about 25 to 35, maybe 40 years. It certainly is not an original one. I have found some original ones in uh, what's called upcountry posted barns because that front shed, or the front straw shed, protects that original front wall, which would have been this. And I know of a barn, I don't think it's on the talk today, uh, of a barn that had a front shed that was built in uh, probably around 1890, and yet that barn star was Quite faded. I mean, it was there, and you could see it and everything. And, the, and, and there was a date of 1857 attached to that barn in three different places, and that meant that there was probably about 35 years of wear, and it made perfect sense. Yes. What were the ingredients for the paint then? There's obviously lead in that, but wouldn't they use natural ingredients as well? Well, linseed oil, um, iron oxide, which you could dig out of the earth, which was yeah. very cheap. 
Um, the history of the use of paint on vernacular buildings is extremely interesting. There was a guild, there was a painter's guild in New England as early as about 1701, 1702. And, but that's a whole other, a whole other time. Okay. And of course, this is the uh, brick inset. Usually there's either eight or nine bricks on each side. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Whoops. Anyway, that one has seven. Uh, this kind of barn construction is, is very prevalent. It's not very prevalent, but it's quite prevalent, I would say, in Lehigh County. It filters into there are certain areas of Berks County. It even goes into uh, Northampton County. But it's very distinctive. If you see a barn like this, it's probably dated after about 1830 or 40 or something like that. Okay. This is just a really small standard barn stone at the eave level. And this is a just a very small barn. I'll bet that barn is no more than 30 feet long. This is a wagon bay. The main road is right here. The wagons are just entering to the barn here. You have your mow area here and your mow area over there. Okay. Here is an upcountry posted Corbay barn. The original barn. You can, if you can eliminate this area forward, you can eliminate that whole shed area, and then this area down toward the rear, that was the original barn, okay? It's a frame constructed probably 1870 or so, 1880 barn, maybe even 1890, uh, frame constructed standard barn. It had a symmetrical roof on it. But then when the farm economy changed dramatically in 1880 and 1890, it needed extra, the barn needed extra crop storage area they put the front shed on, and if they weren't satisfied with that, the farmer would put on a rear shed. Here you can see very, very faded stars in the front, okay? Now, here's a double-decker barn just north of Westchester in Chester County. Can everybody pick up the green tint of the stone on that wall? Okay, so it shows pretty well then. Yeah, this is the only barn that I know of that is made of serpentine stone. Uh, the houses that are that are built in the greater Westchester area that were probably even built after about 18, 1900, 1910 or so. But this is the only barn that I know of that was built purely, a stone barn, purely of uh, serpentine stone. A double decker, what is that? This is a, a three levels, a basement level with a stone arched um, stable wall uh, door entry. This is more or less English, I, that's my understanding. This middle area here, which you don't see in a two-level barn like this, that has, that was uh, on the ends, it had sink mounds. And it also had grain compartment bins here in the middle here. Okay, so you have those two extra areas there. But this barn is actually small, yeah? What's a mow? What's a mow? Yeah. A mow is a area for farm crops. Okay. And if we go upstairs, I can show you what okay. we're doing. Okay. But here, so you can see, can you see that? Um, I guess not. Anyway, the farm, the, the wagon entered in the back here and settled up in this area here. And they, the farmer threw the farm crop on either side. But there was no floor level here or here. It was in the middle bay. Of course, the wagon had to go there. So that's why we call that a sink mount. It sink down to the level of this level up here. That would be that would be the uh, the bottom area of the sink mound. Um, very very English based construction. But the interesting thing about this is that Bob went over to England and he didn't find a single double decker except for one. And the people over there didn't even know about this barn. So it's one of those oddities of of, of scholarship of research. You know, how do you, how do you, people love to assign, you know, an ethnic strain to a building or just about anything, I guess. Um, English, English, German, whatever it might be, okay? That farm was built about 1820 or so. Now, this is an English Lake District farm. This is in Chester County along Route 401. And here we have Stoney Peak. But instead of the frame front wall of the, of the standard barn, here we have stone to the ground, from the ground level all the way up to the eaves level. And here you would have a wagon bay opening. 
the wagon bay would be here, and the mouse on either side. And instead of the four bay protecting the stable wall doors underneath, you had what was called a tent roof. And the tent roof either went the entire length of the barn, which probably wasn't all that common, to within maybe 15, 18 inches of the end of the barn, and it protected the, the stable wall doors. Other than that, the, the two barns, the English face standard, I'm sorry, the English face uh, Lake District barn and the standard barn was really very, very similar on the inside. It just had the same function basically, okay? And here we have a physiographic provinces of the state. And right here is the greatest area for uh, fertility for farming. And this is where Lancaster County is. That's mm. right about there. Mm. Okay. And this is the Susquehanna River here. And it goes to the hill right there. Okay. When did Schweitzer's first appear? on the Pennsylvania landscape, probably uh, sometime in the second quarter. I, I'm now saying more closely the middle third of the 18th century. Um, a, a reference was found to a bank barn. Now this is important to understand. A reference was found to a bank barn <coughs> in the 1720s. And I can't remember exactly where. It wasn't that far from Lancaster City. Probably about six to eight to seven, six to eight to 10 miles or so and the barn was banked. But how do we know that whoever wrote that article or whoever wrote the citation used bank in the same way that we did? We don't know that. So we can't say that it was, because it was banked, that it was a two-level structure, okay? I know Dutch barns in New York and New Jersey is rare, but that are banked, but they don't have, they're not banked structures. So this one particular barn in Somerset County, which is the central part of the state, is banked, but it's banked in a very particular way along the eave wall, not any, any other way. And did, did paintings from the time period ever provide you any insight into like your architectural appearance and stuff? Well, there's in the book there's there's a there's a painting by Benjamin Latrobe of 1801, and there is a classical Schweitzer in that painting. And it was close to the Susquehanna River. It was only about a mile away or something like that. And that's the earliest illustration of a Schweitzer that I know of, the earliest image of a Schweitzer that I know of. Um, it doesn't help that much. I mean, there's probably a whole lot out there that we haven't seen yet. There's, you know, it, it's collecting dust in a basement or whatever. Um, so to answer your question, I, mean, I can't really go off too much beyond that. Um, there is a ground barn at I don't know if I don't going to see that. There's a ground barn of law construction in in Bethlehem, in Northampton County, and the and the image was made by the created by the engravings in 1757. And that is just south of the Lehigh River, what's an area called the Crown Inn. And that's the second earliest illustration, an actual image or an illustration of a barn in North America that I know of. And that, and it had a steep roof too. And that barn was supposed to be 1757 because it's in the, it's in the image. And if it didn't have a steep roof, I wouldn't believe it. So what I'm saying, in effect, is that the the artist was faithful to that feature, and I'm glad he was. It's a wonderful thing. There's another, there's a Holland style Dutch barn in New York State that was from about 1735, and that shows the very typical, prototypical. Uh, construction or, or configuration of a Holland Dutch style uh, three aisle barn. Okay, this is the this is the Holy Grail, and that's the best word that I can think of to describe this barn. This barn is not in Lancaster County, but many many barns in Lancaster County had not so much. Well, it had this appearance, of course, but it had an interior look extremely similar to this. Could you go to the next slide? I don't know if we have it. the next one. Yeah, that's the 1801 uh, barn. Um, go back, go back. Okay, this barn, the reason I'm calling it the Holy Grail of all 200 year old barn structures in Pennsylvania, and this is the whole entire state, is because 95% of the construction, the original elements of construction are still intact in the basement, 
look at how original it is down here. I mean, I know the barn was moved back in the 1970s, but it retained all of its state mangers, which we'll see in the next slide. It's, it's manger troughs, uh, an original uh, staircase, the upper stairs and the back wall. Um, it has all of its original uh, stable wall doors. It has the original granary on this end with an external entry to the granary over there. That's original. Um, next slide. This is the interior of the basement. And this, this view right here, what you're seeing, was what you would have seen in this barn originally, okay? The stake mangers, these stakes are about three feet long. Hmm. This is the manger trough. So the, the farmer would be on the other side of the stake manger, which is all the way back to the rear wall, okay? It went pretty much to the front wall, and he would, he would traverse the feeding alley or the fooder bomb and throw farm produce here, and then he would throw grain to here, okay? These are quite rare east of the Susquehanna River. They're more common west of the Susquehanna River, <coughs> for whatever reason. Um, they just like to change barns here east of the river, more so than west of the river. But it had all four of these state mangers. You know, you see these barns, and it really is too bad. I mean, you can't have all the barns really origi uh, being originally built as such, um, but they just changed them. And that's the kind of a barn that needs to be uh, a museum barn. This barn right here, probably about built about 1790 to 1800, give or take a little bit. This barn should really be, they, they should make an extra special effort to make that barn into, into a museum barn. Whether they will do that or not, I don't know. Is there a reason they couldn't burn it or wall separation? I'm sorry? What was the reason for the vertical wall separation? You mean here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not, that's not original. And so it could have, it could have done, it could have been anything. Okay. Now, yeah, I mean, they would have certain partition walls down there or something, but the actual state mangers, the four of them, the one end wall and the end wall was all original. Maybe gas yeah, something like that? Yeah, it could, it could have been that kind of thing. That's why, yeah, and those are not unusual. Those are not real rare. But for German side lap shingles, they're extremely rare. And this barn had its original one. I know what I was going to say when I said that. I lost my train of thought. The barn, the, the homestead rather, had two families that, let, that lived there, that homesteaded there over a period of 235 years. And the first family was Schaefer. And the second family, ironically enough, was McCoy. And if that barn is not the real McCoy, I, I have no idea what it is. When you said side lap shingles, were you talking about the shingles going over the eaves? No, no, I'm just talking about the regular roof shapes that are on the on the, that cover the, uh, the the rafters and the and the lap thing. The side side lap shingles. In other words, the regular shingle roof shingles that you see after 18, 20, or 30 go from top to bottom or bottom to top, whatever you want to call it. Okay. German side lap shingles, they lap over the side. Oh, okay, right, right. Yeah. They lap over the side. Right. And the and what's interesting about that is that when you see these, and I've heard, I've had maybe three or four conversations with people in the meantime, that they actually, timbers and trees have sapwood and hardwood. Sapwood is the, is the active alive part and is full of sugars, and the hardwood is not. So what the, what the, uh, shingle maker did is that they took their, their sharp knife or sharp tool and eliminated the sapwood so that the, uh, the, the all the creatures couldn't get hold of that sugar in the heart, in, in the sapwood, yeah. and they put it up that way. So it actually has, uh, they're usually about 32 inches long, and so the side of it goes like this, and that part right there, the, the indent, indentation, was the area where they took out the sapwood. This is one of the great Schweitzers um, and many barns, now I shouldn't say many barns, but a number of barns in uh, Lancaster County still have this very steep roof. There's a date stone up here of 1784. We have uh, balustradia, and those are splayed loopholes. Here they have uh, an arrangement of 
one over two over five over four. There's all kinds of different permutations of those of that arrangement. Okay, those holes were splayed. They were probably three to four inches wide on the outside, and they angled in into the interior of the barn as much as 18 inches or so. Okay. And they were not to take aim at marauding Indians. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's not their purpose. Their purpose was uh, ventilation. And it goes back many, many hundreds of years in Europe. Yeah. That's 1784. That represents when the barn, the construction was completed. No. Do you know, in, in looking at these, when it would have started or approximately? Because there Probably was the year structure. before. I mean, it's not like a frame barn or a log barn where it would take three to five months or so, something in that order. It depends on the size of the barn too. Now, one of the, I guess we're not gonna have it in this slide program, but in the 18th century, there was up to 150 barns in Lancaster County. And I don't remember the exact number in uh, Cumberland County, but they had um, what I call long barns, anything over 80 feet long. And they had many bar many uh, Schweizers that were over 100 feet long. And this is the 18th century. That tells you, that, that, that shows you good, very good evidence that the soil fertility here was extraordinary. Those three counties, what's the other county? Dauphin County, maybe. I'm not 100% sure about that, but I think it's Dauphin County. Those three counties had more than four times the amount of long barns than all the other barns that were surveyed in 1798. Yeah. This barn is not that long. It's only about 60, 65 feet long. But it has a very steep roof. And the reason why the forebay here is so short is because the roof is, the roof line is so steep. Uh, if, it were, if it weren't so steep and it was like this, then it can go out further. That's why you have the very narrow forebay here. And there's all the discussion about the granaries being incorporated into the, including this barn, apparently, um, that they did not include granaries in the forebay early on, possibly before 1800, 1810. And why is that? Because they actually put the grain, they stored the grain in a very safe spot. That was their livelihood. They couldn't afford for that to be stolen or anything. So they put the grain, uh, uh, there may be other reasons too, but they put the grain in the attic, and that's for very safe storage, okay? This is a barn in Lancaster County, in Earl Township, which is west, I'm sorry, east of, of, uh, of Lancaster City. <coughs> here, with all these attritions here, you have this part, this part here, down here, not here, and over here, how can you tell what kind of a barn it is? Well, when you look at enough of these, you can tell pretty much. Here's a stone fatigue Schweizer barn. Here's the forebay. That was an addition. The forebay, the, the, the forebay afforded an area below it for um, storage of a, of, a, uh, of a wagon or a shed, uh, a, a cart of some kind. So that is a pretty, pretty obvious that it's a Schweizer. With again, a splayed loophole on the end wall, okay? And here is Bucks County, uh, east of uh, east of Montgomery County. This is stoned at eaves level, not stoned at a, a peak. And here we have the front forebay. This farm was probably built about 1810. You can see that they had, you see this inset here? Can everybody see that? Yeah. Yeah. All right. That was the site, the, the place of the location of a rubber window. And when you see these louvered windows, that generally indicates a barn, there's exceptions, a barn, a Schweitzer or a standard barn built before that 1820 or 30. Okay, the splay loopholes came first, and then the, um, and then the louvered windows. Now, the interesting thing about Schweitzers, if you're really gonna study Schweitzers, is that the greatest concentration of these barns are in Lancaster County, the western third or so of Birch County, and the southern uh, third or so of Lebanon County. The farther east you go into Berks, the rest of Berks, into Lehigh County, into Northampton County, the fewer and fewer Schweitzers you would see. That's <coughs> another reason why I believe very strongly that, that Schweitzer started in Lancaster County. Okay? 
<coughs> this is a beautiful barn in uh, in extreme western uh, Berks County. It's in Bethel. Probably not much farther away than uh, farther removed from the county border of uh, Lancaster County, maybe three miles at the, at the very most. Whether this barn was moved or not, I don't know. It's one of the great double log crib Schweitzers in the state, as far as I know. All oak log construction. Here's the loading opening, the wagon. The one, this is the four bay over here, okay? So the wagons would enter here, they would unload their corn crop here, and when it got filled up to whatever level, then they, they threw it over uh, the top log over here. Well, these are wonderful. This is a wonderful barn, and I hope it's still there and it can stay there, okay? One of the, to me, one of the great barns of, of Lancaster County, this is in the New Holland area, Stone to the Peak. Look at that roof piece there. Isn't that wonderful? Oh. Um, front four bay appendage right there, issued under the roof line. The uh, back side of the barn on this side here, enlarged cornerstones or, or what were called coins. Probably, uh, I think it's probably a little bit earlier than 1800 or so. Probably 1790, okay? This is a rare barn. This is in Reinholz. Who said they were from Reinholz? Well, I tore you one did. down from that, that barn. You didn't tear that one down. No. <laughs> okay, there's no one good sign. Yeah. <laughs> you tore down a Schweitzer? No. No? It was just a, it was all frame, and it had a, it had a four day out to the gate of Yeah, it happened. Yeah. It happened, it happened. It happened. But this is a law of construction. This is the only barn in North America for that matter that I've ever seen where the rear wall of the basement was logged, which implies that the area in back of the rear wall was some of the material, and I couldn't get back there to really look at it. But here again, if you can eliminate this in your mind, uh, an asymmetric roof line, this is a Schweitzer. And that's not far from the county border, okay? Just to clarify, I set that barn back up again. Oh, you did? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, so you didn't, your dreams weren't that bad. Yeah, it, it, was, it was literally three feet off the road. We had wow. to do it. So I set it back up in Schubert County. Oh, Schubert County. Where's Schubert County? Uh, west of uh, Pine Grove. Okay. Another Schweitzer. This one is in Berks County near Wilmersdorf. And this is stone to the east level. Uh, front four bay here. Displayed loopholes. You don't find many barns, and I can't say 100% why. It would be too long, I guess, to really talk about it. But the end wall here has displayed loopholes, but they're pretty rare on the barns that have construction only stone to the eaves level, okay? This end wall, this far end wall, is all framed. And they're, we're in there, and the people have been there for decades, and they said, oh yeah, this is a, a two-section barn, and the, the other section uh, was added on, and it's maybe 12 or 14 feet long or something like that. And I knew that that was false. Well, how did I know that it was false? The reason is because the wall plate here, let's assume that this is an eave wall and you have this timber right here and forget about the splice back over there wherever it is exactly. How could you have a barn that was added uh, onto if you didn't have a splice where the two sections met? You can't have that. So anyway, that, that solved that problem. Um, I saw a barn late this morning where, where you could clearly see that the barn was extended on the far end. When you have a house and a barn of two sections, and you 90 to 95% of the time, there's exceptions to this, you have the shorter section as the, as the addition and the longer, the longer part as the original part. And that holds true for both barns and houses. Mm -hmm. So this is all built in one section, okay. This is a barn that burned in 1857, I think, one of the great brick-ended barns in Franklin County. A friend of mine found about 110 of these barns. It's, it's the barn, it's, a, it's, a, it's the brick barn mecca of North America, really. And look at that, look at that wonderful brickwork. I wonder 
if there's any paperwork that was ever left over, um, well, if, if it ever existed at all, and they did they do this just freehand, so to speak? Did they did they have any kind of a symbol or schematic or anything like that? Uh, just a wonderful thing. Again, the sheets of wheat here, uh, a diamond, sheets of wheat, diamond, just wonderful. They're, they're kind of geniuses, I thought. Mm -hmm. Okay. Absolutely. This is a very late built barn. This is in Lebanon County in the north. I think that's in the northwest section. It wasn't all log. It was log Schweitzer, but it was also frame. So those two materials, log and frame. And back over here, I think, somewhere over here, I think, is the date stone of 1856. That's very late for Schweitzer. Schweitzers came in, again, middle third of the 18th century, probably up to about the Civil War. I know of one Schweitzer that was built as late as the 1870s, okay? Ah, uh, this is a barn, this is the barn. Now I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell everybody, and I said, to, said this to the group two weeks ago. I've been very fortunate, I've been doing this for a long time. I've been up in Canada, I've been west, I've been in, in New England, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, area south and everything. This barn, the Isaac Long barn, is the most interesting barn I've ever come across in North America. Wow. Mm -hmm. Without exception. It has more mystery, more, That's crazy. more um, craziness to it, meaning you don't understand it, than any other barn that I've ever seen. Uh, Murray Rothbard was an economist, and he said that one of the, uh, Adam Smith, you may know that, I think he said it about Adam Smith. Maybe I shouldn't have even said that. But Adam, one, of, one of the other economists who really didn't know what they were talking about, he said of this other economist, he said he was a, an enigma inside a puzzle, inside a, a mystery. <laughs> and that's what that barn is. <laughs> Can we go to the next slide? I don't know what we have here. Yeah, this is a little bit better. Okay, good. This area here of the Isaac Long Barn, which is in Mannheim, this, the original section is from here to about there. I'm not sure. I don't know if it was two doors or one door. It really doesn't matter. Anyway, this had a date. Uh, go to the next one. Thank you. It has a car date of 1754, right there. Okay? It was another building on the property. It was a different building. This is a rail, any horizontal um, element over a window or a door is called a rail. These are the styles, okay? This is not centered on the rail. Why was that? Why were these centered? Was there a reason for it? I mean, I don't know. But look at this. This is H, it looks like HL. It's really I, L, Jacob. I'm not sorry, Isaac. It's Isaac. This looks like a back side of a wheelchair, <laughs> but it's really a one. I'm calling it a German one for lack of a better term, okay? Very, very common for 18th century card dates in the Germanic uh, culture. It has a, uh, a vertical card and then it squiggles around to one side, it squiggles around to the other side. Okay, this door, for whatever reason, was altered where the, the, the uh, style here, which is about maybe six inches wide, <coughs> uh, didn't maintain itself on this side. Why? And you can see that it was there originally because there's a gap right here on the other side. So you look at these things and you say, what in the devil did they do that? Was there a, was there a destructive element or agent that, that created that? In any event, um, this card date itself, this is not that they painted over this, which they should have, you never know. Um, the AN is for Adam in the year of our Lord, of course. But the N, look at the N, the N is reversed. It's not a normal N. And that's what I call an N reversal. And I've been doing a study of these for the last five years. I never I never focused in on it. I saw them again and again and again. Now I have a list of a few dozen of these things. It's a reversal. It's supposed to negate the effect of our transient existence on the face of the earth. Okay? Not many people live beyond 120 or even 100, okay? It's ephemeral, it's transient, it doesn't last long. And I believe that they were trying, well, we can put the date of 1754 up there, 
but that doesn't mean that you know that's that important. But they did that anyway. Okay, that's what I think was going on with this. Mm -hmm. uh, the original part of the barn was somewhere around here. It extended about 38 feet around. <coughs> then it was. Did I, I didn't. It, the, well, the original part extended out to that, and then in the 1760s, because they said that the brethren met at the barn at the Isaac Wong homestead um, in 1767. Again, this is a problem of, of, of historic interpretation. When they said they met at the barn, did they mean this barn? Did they mean another barn? Who can say? But it was extended out to 108 feet. I think it probably was the original barn, but we don't know that, okay? Now, this is Bob taking a picture of the uh, front wall of the barn, okay? This is a Germanic Liebenstuhl uh, roof construction. This principal rafter here, which goes from here all the way up to there, it's tapered, it's about six inches or so wide here, and about 12 inches wide there. It's tapered to have more wood material here to receive the pearl and plate right there, okay? It goes back to Germanic sources from Europe, of course, back to the 1380s. That's how far back it goes. And what county has the most examples of leaving the shoes? Lancaster. Lancaster County, okay. Uh, the whole full truss has a principal rafter. It has a, a straining beam which connects the ends of the truncated principal rafters and another beam which is called a collar beam, okay? And a brace. Here you can see, well, the pockets of the brace or the borders of the brace. So it has five different centers to it. Uh, the earliest, the earliest one is the um, the Hanser House, which is 1719, and that has a variant leading the shoe. So that's the interior roof structure of the Isaac Long Bar. Okay. Were there ridge poles? I'm sorry. No. No, it had no ridge pole. Bridge beam, actually. Bridge beam. Now, this is another part of the great mystery here. I think the homestead was first settled in about 18, 1720 or so. On the far side of the basement level uh, transverse wall here, transverse being front to back, you have all these recycled timbers here with this notching here, this V, this full dovetail notching here. There's probably about eight or nine of these. Where did that come from? This is part of the mystery. So we don't know what this is all about. You could probably do maybe not a PhD thesis, but you could do a master's thesis on this. I raised maybe $15,000, $20,000, get it dendrodated like crazy. And uh, dendrodating is core drilling where you take a core, a core sample of wood and uh, prepare it, sand it, and then compare it, send it to a lab, a dendrodating lab, and then uh, comparing it with the master list, and you come up with a date when the timbers were felled. And we're assuming that the barn or the structure, whatever it was, the Miller House, whatever, was built the following year. And that's most often the case, but not always. But there it is. I mean, this barn really is a mystery. Bob and I uh, were there probably about four times. I've been there for a total of maybe seven times. I still have not figured it all out. We know certain kinds of things where the original part was built seven of course, that you saw, and then it was extended. So we know some things, but not everything. So that Does is the size of timber give you an idea? The, the size of the size. timber? Size? Yeah, in general, in general, but not always. I know a barn in New York State that was built probably about 1820, that had 24-inch uh, inch timber. So you have to be careful about that. Because you don't know if some if some farmer, he, he, he sold his property and it had had 95 acres of, of virgin pine or virgin oak. So why couldn't he sell it off? And he said, hey, I need the money. And just sell it to a farmer. And he said, well, I'm building a barn. So, you know, you, you have to be really, really careful about interpreting these kinds of things. This is a slice of an oak timber. This came from a 1754 barn, which is the earliest positively identified <coughs> part of the barn in all of PA. This is a, called a weeny edge or a bark edge, and to get the proper date, you have to have a weeny edge. You have to have a bark edge 
which signifies when the last year that the tree grew an annual growth frame, um, and that's how it's done. But all of these timbers, I don't know how many uh, annual growth frames are there, but that is a beautiful piece of oak, of oak wood, okay? Here we have the King family. This is a lot of Frank Schweitzer. I wish I could take everybody to this. This is southeast of Gant, Lancaster City. I think it's in East Lancaster. Uh, but it's, it's a bow frame and log, okay? <clears throat> this is the Herman log. And it doesn't look like a log Schweitzer, but it is. Well, don't tell me it's a log Schweitzer. Let's go to the next one. Oh boy, next one. Oh, sugar, go back. Okay, thank you. Um, what happened was, is that the original barn was double log crib construction. You saw that one in the barn in Berks County at Bethel. And that was probably around 1780, give or take, with a reaper screw, which is rare. And then this, this barn, this uh, is the addition, and it was stone. Stone on the end wall, stone with the eaves level, and stone on the, on the rear wall. And that was probably built around 1820 or 30, something on that order. That's a great one, one of the great barns in all of Lancaster County. Okay? This is another really fine barn. Uh, very likely a Schweitzer. I, I hadn't been inside it, but this is. Uh, yeah, I say it's a great revamp of the roof and the rear stone shed. This is not at all the original um, roof structure. It's a symmetrical roof line, and we know that Schweitzers have asymmetrical roof lines. So anyway, that's not original. But they changed the barns tremendously from era to era to era, according to the farm economy. This barn has a date stone right here of 1770. The earliest authentic Schweitzer with a date that we know of in Pennsylvania. All stone. It has five alternating bays. Now, what do I mean by alternating bays? Alternating bays in that, in that the bay arrangement was a mow, a wagon bay, a mow, a wagon bay, and a mow. Okay, and that happens occasionally. Not very often. I know of a 1855 or so a frame barn, a, a two level barn in New Jersey, in western New Jersey, in Warren County that has that bay arrangement. Like that, okay. Do you know where that is, Larry? Scott? Where this is? Yes. I have what the exact location. I have the exact location. It again, the, the, these real early barns are southwest, sorry, southeast of uh, of, of Lancaster, Lancaster City. City. Yeah. Okay. okay. The story of the Schweitzer barn is only just begun. Mm -hmm. Many hundreds of these barns remain to be seen and examined, mm -hmm. and you know we've just barely scratched the surface. This morning, I probably saw at least eight or ten uh, Schweitzer barns that I had never seen. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's, you know, if you want to, if you want to be a barn researcher or a barn writer or whatever, the whole world is out there for you to do that. I think this is the last slide. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Thank you, everybody, for showing up. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? He would chip all of them off. So this essentially is it's not an axe, it's actually a chisel. And then you would clean it up. I didn't bring one along with an axe. Oh, yeah. Of course, your grist mills back then can be converted over to cut the beans. Yes. This piece here I wrote. It's on the back of uh, a publication. Oh, well, then I have to grab the book. Then I have to. Okay, because I bought that book. And if you'd like to know the very brief story behind this. I was 12 years in the apple business on an 1820 barn. It was actually the barn that stopped as a kiss of gold. Started. And, um, 
Ziggler's and Ziggler's Apple Sale, they, they purchased the property from the families, and they sold, the barn came down to the barn. I still have the dates that we but I spent 12 years in that barn. I was just so heartbroken. I still take care of the family cemetery. The Rudy family built this one. Charles, I wrote this in probably 25 years. Crime. Where was that barn located? No, it's on Stauffer Road, across from Bowser's Tree Farm. Uh, Bowser's Christmas Tree Farm. We're in like the Lancaster Airport. Oh, okay. Yeah. Stauffer Road, Millport Road. Okay, Millport, I can picture myself. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> They took the barn down, and that's right. This is actually what it used to look like. Yeah.
can actually be formed at mills. They can actually angle the timber in the mill and have it cut so that a taper is created. Even back which in the is, 18th century. Yes, which I call very, very, say is very, very interesting. Yeah. So there'd be a combination of hand hewn and. Uh, yes. And, wow, yes, I've seen several examples of that. Fascinating. Yeah. Which now, one, one of the thing, one of the things that you know that some of these timbers are recycled is because when you look at the straining beam, if that brace were taken out on both ends, the mortise is really long. I've seen it up to like 15 inches long, and you'd have to do that because the the the, the, uh, the angle of the connection of the brace would dictate that. Uh -huh. If it were if it were more steeply pitched instead of like this it would be like that, then the mortise would be shorter because okay. it's, it's steeper. Which one's the common rafter, the one on top going across? No, no, that's that's a collar beam. These are these are the common rafters. Oh, okay. Right these here. little guys. Yes. Okay. Those are the common rafters, right. But they lean on the, they lean on these, these longitudinal guys. They lean on the purlin plate and they should not lean here on the uh, on the lower uh, partial barn length uh, plate. No, it only leans on one thing. So because if you if you if you designed it so that it leaned on two, it may not be an exact alignment. And the lower kind of the lower one is used for what? It's it's just for stability. It's for yeah. longitudinal stability. Oh oh, so the the building. Yes doesn't... yes. Okay. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Yes, all that's right. right. I had a question. What are all these nails for? There's nails all over the place, you know? Where, where do you see them? Well, you know, like in the yeah. bottom of that brace, and um, here there's some nails. Well, because they can. Because they can. Don't they fasten, you know, with the pegs? Pegs is what draw these things tight, right? So why are there nails? Well, you know, there's a whole school of thought that actually when you have a mortise and tenon and you, and you peg it, it makes it weaker. Mm. The people have said that. Mm. Yeah. Well, it surely, it surely does make the tenon look. Well, I don't know actually. That's interesting. Yeah, I know. That's what I'm saying. I don't know. I don't know either. Yeah. I'm not a builder, and I don't know all the, uh, the logistics and some of these that. nails wouldn't have been original. Maybe. But why are they there even after the fact? Well, everything dry, as just stuff to, dries out, oh, some stars are and, yes. and then you furthermore, they might even use so some of these when they, re when they rebuilt this. Yeah. Rebuilt yeah. Okay. To try to, I did, to, try to suck it tight, you think? Well, or for, I did, not I right. actually, I actually, I actually yeah, was, had a man. bucket of rust. Did you have someone like guiding you to it? I would try and put a rusty nail in cover a whole arch oh, right. of and yeah, yeah, they, 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 they can be plastered to a certain degree. Yeah, it was torn down and then rebuilt in the 70s and then opened in the But see, all your, everything dries out. I think, yeah. That's enough wire. So this concludes this, um, lecture that was given here by Greg Huber uh, on the Schweitzer barn right here that's right behind me here at Historic Rockford. If you want more information check out uh, the Rockford's uh, website. I'll post that in the description. Um, and uh, if you like this type of content please consider like, commenting, sharing, subscribing and as always Go create your own adventure, and I'll see you at the next location.